but don't you agree that any such potential transition from biology to uh, be it virtual reality or silicon based or or what others have called becoming uploads would have great impacts on uh, your own work and on your own field. I mean, we already do know how to pretty much upkeep and maintain computers indefinitely by replacing their broken parts and so on. And thus, if we move from biology to become silicon-based, for example, or software-based uh, entities, then in a way that would fulfill your quest to extend uh, the healthy life uh, span of, of humanity. I think you're absolutely right. I think that that is certainly one scenario in which aging would be defeated. Another scenario in which aging would be defeated would be the creation of friendly artificial general intelligence, in which we had simply robots and other completely external devices which were able to make our lives completely safe, both medically and in terms of the, availability, the possibility of accidents or asteroid impacts or whatever. Um, despite the fact that we are made out of this squishy stuff. Uh, you know, there are lots of scenarios. Um, I think, however, that what that tells us is that it's very important for all of the potential scenarios that could um, extend our healthy lives to be pursued aggressively by the various specialists on those areas of technology, because we just don't know which of these things is going to come first. Personally, my hunch is that the development of biotechnology that can achieve longevity escape velocity is going to be easier and going to happen more quickly than the development of molecular manufacturing and therefore the development oh, and certainly the development of anything as ambitious as uploading um but if i'm wrong then that's fine by me well singularity weblogs tagline is the question will technology replace biology and I have the tradition of asking all of my podcast guests to answer that question. So, in your opinion, will technology replace biology? If I had to guess about the sequence of events, so to speak, the, uh, the, about what would actually happen uh, and what our priorities would be for subsequent things to happen, then my answer would be no. I think that what's likely to occur is, first of all, we will get biotechnology of the sort that I'm working on that will allow us to maintain health as long as we like, just so long as we stay out of the way of asteroids and trucks and so on. Then thereafter, we will develop, in fact, perhaps around the same time, computers with the ability to protect us very, very thoroughly indeed from all types of physical danger and indeed infectious diseases, for example, so that we essentially eliminate all causes of death and indeed of disease um, and, and injury. Once we've got to that point, the motivations for developing technologies such as uploading will be somewhat diminished, I think. We can imagine that there will be certain motivations for doing so in terms of, for example, uh, allowing our intelligence to be enhanced much more. But we already have technologies for enhancing our intelligence externally, so to speak, such as the internet, for example. And I think it's very possible that we will adopt an attitude, I'm not saying everybody, but perhaps most of humanity anyway, an attitude that actually we prefer to be human rather than to develop too rapidly into something that might be called post-human. So personally, I suspect that we will continue to um, remain biological pretty much indefinitely. One of the arguments behind the development of upload technology is the argument that this is a technology that we will inevitably have to develop, provided that we are interested in space travel and especially intergalactic uh, space travel. I I, I think that's perfectly clear. I think that it would be very difficult indeed to facilitate intergalactic space travel without that sort of technology. But the question then is, who actually wants to actually undertake intergalactic space travel? Um, 
personally, it doesn't really attract me very much. And, you know, space is a rather unfriendly place to be. I think that so long as we can develop technologies that allow our quality of life down here in the solar system to be as high as we like, the motivation to go elsewhere may be rather limited. Yes, but what about Stephen Hawking's latest argument that in the long run, we must either spread throughout the universe and conquer other planets and other worlds, or basically face extinction here on our own planet one way or another. Ah, yes, but let's be clear. The assumptions that Stephen was making were very different from the ones that you and I are making here. If we talk about a scenario in which we have developed artificial general intelligence of the nature that um, the people who work in that area describe, in other words, friendly AI that um, has our interests at heart, but that has the property of recursive self-improvement so that it becomes pretty much you know, unimaginably powerful and, of course, unimaginably powerful in terms of its physical um, prowess as well as its intellectual prowess, then we have a scenario in which the assumptions that Hawking made really don't apply anymore. I think it's very hard to imagine, for example, that it would take more than a decade or even a year for full-blown artificial general intelligence to develop technologies that would completely eliminate the prospect of an asteroid impact. I think it's extremely hard to imagine that it would take more than a thousand years for such technology to develop ways to defuse nearby stars that might be in danger of exploding, for example. So there are a lot of reasons why Hawking could easily be completely wrong. I see. That's an important distinction to make between our starting point and uh, Stephen Hawking's starting point. And um, I think it's a, it's a, it makes perfect sense to me. Uh, but what about the general risks or dangers of a technological singularity? How do you see that as an option? Personally, I just don't know. I think that it certainly depends how we define the singularity. So the, I think the most popular definition among people who, um, who talk about this is the one that I've been using so far in this interview, namely the development of recursively improving artificial general intelligence. And if that were developed, then I've got to say I'm not very optimistic. I think that it's very unlikely that the that any, any truly recursively self-improving system can be made genuinely friendly in an in invariant way, as Elias Yudkowsky likes to describe it. Now, I freely admit that this is really just a hunch, and I can't back it up with any profound, you know, uh, robust argument, but that is my hunch, that a f truly friendly AGI with recursive self-improvement is not possible. However, the good news is that my other hunch is that I think that truly recursively self-improving AI is probably not possible either. I think that it is a mistake to regard uh, the human brain, for example, as, um, as an existence proof that recursively self-improving AI is possible. I think that the difference here is that you know, it's easy enough to write self-modifying code or code that, or programs that write other programs. But the programs that are written or the parts of programs that are self-modifying are, you know, a lot simpler than the programs that do the writing or the self-modifying. And I have a suspicion that there is a, a, a fundamental minimum to that difference of complexity. In other words, that a program of complexity X just cannot create a program of complexity greater than X or even greater than X minus some constant whatever. Again, this is absolutely a hunch, but if it's true, then we can kiss goodbye to the idea of recursive self-improvement. 